I want to read the scripture reading from Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Well, how can you say to your brother, uh, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's the log in your own eye? You hypocrites, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give to dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. That's God's word to us today. Church, it's a real privilege for me to stand here this morning and bring you God's Word. And uh, it's, so when we come to a passage of Scripture like this, very well-known three verses, uh, you know, judge not the speck um, in each other's eyes, the plank in our own eye, ask, seek, knock, and it'll be given to you. God gives good gifts and the golden rule. Man, it's actually quite hard sometimes, I think, to come to a text and maybe try and glean something new. I was actually even feeling the pressure of reading it and saying, well, there's not much more for me to say other than to read the verses and say, go do this as you were. Um, But what we're going to do today is go verse by verse through the text and try and apply it to our lives. And so in preparation, I went to one of the wisest people on staff, Ansune, and I went to her and asked her a question. Um, And there was also, I didn't realize this, but our kids' ministry had just gone through the Sermon on the Mount. And so not only did I glean some epic wisdom from Ansune, but I also got possibly the cutest video you will ever see. Um, And it is a video that I think summarizes our text brilliantly. So please check it out. Did you learn it in Sunday school today? About that you can't, you mustn't, you mustn't be happy and want other people to be, um, be punished. Otherwise, and otherwise you'll just have a big log in your face. And you'll just have a splinter. There you go, church. If you are happy because other people are getting punished, you're getting a log in your eye. (laughs) Thank you, Tamsin. And um, Kerry, Tamsin's mom, and also one of our elders, just asked me to make sure I don't lead the church astray with some dodgy theology. Um, And so we're going to walk through this line by line. But uh, just, it is really as simple as it kind of seems. But at the same time, Jesus is a, he isn't just a great teacher, right? He's the son of God. He is divine. And so we are going to see some beautiful thoughts and arguments that are um, centuries ahead of its time. And so let's dive right in. And so verse one, Actually, before we even get to verse one, sorry, I want to point, draw your attention to an argument style that Jesus is going to use through one through verses one through six and then verses uh, seven through 11. What Jesus does is he makes a statement, then he gives an explanation of that statement, an example which helps us understand his statement, and then lastly, a teaching. And so we're gonna try to base our understanding off the teaching of Jesus. And so with that, let's dive right into verse one. Plain and simple, this is what Jesus says. Judge not that you be not judged. An opening statement, and I think what he's doing is really causing his listeners to lean in, to lean in and think, okay, judge not lest you be judged. Now, anyone out there, have you ever not judged someone, like anyone? Have you ever never made a judgment? I don't think so. And so none of us have been able to follow the statement that Jesus makes to not 
judge. Then he goes on with his explanation of his statement. He says, for the judgments you pronounce, you will be judged. And the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so he fleshes this out for us. Jesus fleshes out what he means by telling us that we are not to judge lest we be judged. Because if we do judge others, the exact measure of judgment we extend to the people outside of ourselves, we will in turn receive Now, I remember being a young boy, I'm not sure where I heard this, maybe it was at school or um, when I was a young child at Sunday school, but there was this whole thing about if you point at someone, there's three fingers pointing back. And um, I think they were trying to teach me that if I point my fingers, I'm actually should really should look at myself and I'm judging. But I remember finding a loophole and being like, but there's also a finger pointing up to God. So, man, Um, obviously it didn't listen very well in Sunday school. But really what Jesus is um, trying to help us see here is that we are to be very cautious and careful in the way we judge because the exact measure that we extend outward from ourselves, we in turn will receive. Really the teaching here is that we are really responsible for the level of judgment that we will one day receive. And so we have to be so careful and cautious about how we go about judging people. Verse four, Jesus goes on. Oh, sorry, rather, uh, verse three. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Jesus now has moved to the example section. And uh, Jesus is brilliant because this is actually a, a sarcastic statement, a comical statement, if you will. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? A speck, a piece of sawdust, how do you see that in someone else's eye? When you have a literal log like this in your own eye, anyone ever have something that big stuck in their eye? Kids? Kid, nothing, eh? Never. I'm seeing one hand, all right, you should see a doctor. (laughs) It's comical for Jesus to suggest that you won't notice a log in your eye, but notice this tiny little speck in your brother's eye. Jesus is causing the listeners of first century Israel to lean in, to think, okay, he said, I mustn't judge, that's impossible. Then he said, the measure of judgment I use on someone, I'm gonna receive back to my self-care, this is new to me. And then to be almost shocked with, hang on, I don't understand, how do I have a log in my eye but notice someone else's speck? Jesus goes on in verse four, or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? He expands on his example for us. Again, it is comical for Jesus to say this. I say flippantly almost that he's just like a stand-up comedian. Jesus, I can just picture the guys laughing and being, that's insane. Because picture this, picture what Jesus is saying. Who's helped someone get something out of their eye before? Anyone here? Right? How close do you have to get to that person? Right? I mean, you don't do it this. I mean, you could try, but you get right in. And you're kind of like looking. I actually remember watching Ripley's Believe It or Not. This person used their tongue. It was pretty weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty gross. Kids, don't do that. All right? But they would lean in and, and you know, you, you come and you just get the little speck out their eye. How are you going to get that close to someone when you have an actual log in your eye? You can't get that close. It's impossible. And so Jesus is being quite comical here, saying it is impossible for this to be true. So he moves on to verse five and says, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. This is the teaching where Jesus is landing it. He started with a statement, moved to an uh, an explanation and an example, and now in the teaching. The teaching is, take the log out of your own eye. Look inward. It's not never judge. It's not make sure you don't ever have a speck in your eye or a log in your eye. The teaching here is to look inward. Look into your heart so that you will see clearly and then be able to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And so let me summarize Jesus' teaching here for us. He started with a statement, do not judge others. Then from an explanation, he said, the measure you judge by, you will be judged by. Then his example is the plank in your eye and the speck in your brother's. And lastly, look inward before you judge others. Church, what I want us to see here is that Jesus is not calling us to never judge someone. 
In fact, in verse six, we are forced to judge people, which we'll get to in just a second. Later on, in, uh, we, speak, we, we see Jesus teaching about the fruits, that we'll know people by their fruits. You have to be willing and able to judge someone uh, to understand if their fruits are good or bad. Uh, we are told to look out for false prophets and there's a level of judgment you will need to be able to discern whether their teachings are true or not. And so the teaching here is not never judge, but rather look inward to your own heart before you extend a judgment to someone else. And so I was fortunate enough to preach through um, the Beatitudes or as Pastor Rich likes to call them, the Beautiful attitudes, all right? The beautiful attitudes. Kids, write that one down. And um, the very first one is, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now, when I read this, I think someone can only attain this level of non-judgment if they are truly poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit is to acknowledge just how much you need the grace of God, just how much you fall short of the glory of God. It's to have really a right view of yourself. And so I think when we have the right view of ourself, when we look inward, we're able to see our hearts and the mess that our hearts are, which then gives us the grace and mercy to extend to other people, to know that there was a great log in our eyes. Our hearts were full of sin and God being rich in mercy forgave us those, those sins. God himself took the log out of our eyes. God himself gave us a pure heart. And so it is with that that we are able to clearly see the speck in our brother's eye and help them because we are called to help correct people. If we see a brother or sister going astray, making a bad life decision, who may be caught in sin, we are to ex exercise a level of judgment to come alongside that person. But the word I want us to be, draw out here is in verse five, Jesus says, you hypocrite. And so when we call out someone's sin, when we see the speck in their eye, we aren't meant to go to them as hypocrites, as hyper criticism or critics rather, but rather to come alongside them in love and grace and speak truth over their lives. And the only way we can come alongside someone who is falling short of the glory of God, just as we are, is to know our own hearts and to recognize how far we fall short. And then we are able to clearly see what our brother and sister need. And so as I was trying to apply the teaching of Jesus to look inward before I look outward, I was trying to think of a few examples that I could give you guys uh, in your own lives where you may have um, done this sort of thing, judge someone prematurely or unfairly. And to be honest, all the examples are mine and then it was too embarrassing for me to share them up here. Um, but rather I thought, let me try call to some uh, thoughts or thought processes that you may have um, and you may find yourself in this space. And so one of the first thoughts I thought of is often and judging comes to like a comparison space, right? And so you would look at someone, I recently won something at a law restaurant and this made me thought of this, where I've seen other people win stuff like on Instagram and, or whatever it is and I just think, oh, lucky them, man. Ugh. I never get to win stuff. And then I won something and I put it on Instagram. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's an element of comparison here thinking, man, how come they get stuff but I don't? Like, what did they do to deserve that? Uh, there's another one, maybe you've had this one. Sure, I wouldn't do that. All right, again, a judgment thinking, well, I'm better than that person. I would never do that thing. Uh, like post winning something on Instagram. Um, or maybe lastly, well, if that's the way they want to spend their money, that's up to them. I.e., I spend my money better than those people. Now, I think what is so important for us to notice here is that it, what Jesus is calling us to is that it's heart over action. We don't know the reason or the heart behind that person's action. And so we cannot fairly judge them. Only God knows the heart. And so in the same way, I would say in those examples, well, are you perfectly righteous then? Uh, and perfect before the law in the way you spend your money for every cent? Because if you are, then for sure, judge the person for the way they're spending their money. But I can guarantee you, there have been times you've probably bought something you shouldn't have bought. Maybe if you, as you judge someone for doing something that you wouldn't do, are you perfect in all your actions? Have you never made a mistake? Probably not, because you're not Jesus. And have you ever received a gift for something that you did nothing to uh, 
to get. Outside of the gospel, no, all right? I think uh, there's probably many of us who have received free gifts over the time. And so for us to extend judgment to a person and for receiving something that they did nothing for or uh, doing something we would never do or the way they spend their money, we are ourselves actually looking, it's, it's almost like a, um, a red flag, I think, that God has given us to say, hey, there's something not right in our hearts. Why am I looking in that person and thinking, shame on you, hang on, there's three fingers coming back here. I think God wants to do something in my heart. And so let me look inward. Let me do business with God around the way I spend my money or the very thing that's annoying me about the way that person is doing something. Let me look toward myself. And so on the teaching that Jesus has, not the statement, judge not. I think people have used this verse a few times to throw out. You know, you come alongside someone, maybe you've seen someone, you've done the inward introspection, you've seen the speck in a brother's eye, you've removed the log from your eye and you humbly come to say to your brother or sister, hey, I don't think you should speak to people that way. Like, or man, I don't think it's loving when you use those words. And it may be flip back and say, hey, 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 judge not, lest you be judged. Often that verse has been thrown back to say we can't judge, but that's the statement that Jesus makes. The teaching that Jesus makes is about our hearts before him. And so church family, what I want to encourage you to do is to look inward, to do business with your heart and with the Lord and understand where you fall short of the glory of God so that you are humble and able to clearly see when you should come alongside someone to love and nourish them back towards the way of Jesus. Now, the difficulty of verse six, I almost wish I could have left it out. I asked Justin, he said, no. So we've got to go there. So kids, you've got to read every part of your Bible, right? You can't just read the parts that are easy. And this is what verse says. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. What is going on here? All right. And so it's a symbolic sentence from Jesus. Do not give dogs. Dogs in ancient Israel were unclean, dirty scavengers. They were not the fluffy, cool pets that we have. Who has a pet dog here? Anyway, anyone? If you show me by hands, pet dogs. You love your dogs, right? You love them? Very good. Now in Israel, people did not love their dogs, all right? They were not cool pets. Now, and then Jesus goes on and says, do not throw your pearls before them. Now that again, quite an outrageous statement. Who would throw pearls before a dog? Pearls are precious. And so what, God, what Jesus is telling, showing us here, that the pearls represent the kingdom message, the, the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is here to proclaim, the gospel message, the good news. And then uh, he tells us not to throw them before pigs. Uh, pigs, again, represent unclean animals. They were unclean uh, in ancient Israel. They are still unclean today to the Jews. And so they are dirty animals. And so essentially what Jesus is saying, don't give the kingdom of gospel away to people who do not want it, to um, filthy pigs that may turn and trample the good news of the gospel and attack you. And so... It's quite a hard message to understand, but we see Matthew, uh, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 14, Jesus giving, giving an instruction to his disciples saying, take the gospel message out into the towns, but should they not listen to you, dust your feet off and go on to the next. I think that's the, the, the gist of what is going on here, that not everyone will receive the gospel message. Some people may even, may even spurn you for it and, uh, and shout at you and be angry at you. Jesus is saying, Use your judgment and move away from them and take the gospel message, the pearls, to those who will hear it. And so there's this beautiful tension that Jesus is showing us, verses one through five, or this opening statement really, verse one, all the way through to verse six, that we don't live in a binary world. It's not ones and zeros. There's a tension here for us to manage. And we are to use our judgment and discernment to know when and who to take the gospel to. And if it's not working, it's okay to dust your feet and move on because there are millions of people who need to hear the gospel message preached. All right, let's move on to verses one, uh, sorry, seven through 11. Ask, seek, and knock. Now again, well-known scripture for us, very well-known. But Jesus here again uses his same argument structure. He makes a statement, he gives, gives an explanation, an example, and then finally a teaching. All right, so let's dive right in. Verse 
Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Very clear statement. And what Jesus is talking about here is our prayer life, our ability to come before the Lord and ask of him what we need, to seek of him for the good things that he's willing to give us and to knock. And then what I find interesting about verse eight is really Jesus almost repeats himself, but he adds in one special thing. Kids, let's see if you can notice it, all right? So I want you to shout out when I read. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Anything, what did you guys notice in that difference? Kids, did you see anything? For everyone, right? Jesus is basically saying the same thing. Ask and you will receive, seek you will find, knock it will be opened. But he adds in for everyone. So Jesus takes his statements and in his explanation, he localizes it in us, people who are made in his image. And it makes it, instead of this ethereal kind of thing for us to believe, it makes it personal, personable, that Jesus says, if you, my good children, well, children of God the Father, ask, it will be given. If you seek, you will find. And if you Knock, it will be open to you. And we have that beautiful privilege that Jesus offers to us. And then we go on into verse nine. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Verse 10 says, or if you ask for a fish, will give him a serpent. Here we're in the example section of Jesus's uh, great teaching here. Now, unless you're a practical joker, like our legendary Pastor Justin. I've heard of the great uh, practical jokes he's played on people before. Um, No, even a practical joker like Justin would not do this to someone who comes to them with need, deep need, and says, ha, 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 let me give you a stone instead of bread. Shame, you're so hungry, here's a stone. That's not a joke, that is harsh and mean and awful. And so I think for the kids in the service, I mean, I'm sure you've gone to mom and dad before and asked for something, right? And have they kind of laughed you off and given you the exact opposite of what you asked for? Unless it was like a PlayStation and you're not ready for a PlayStation, right? But if you go for a real need, like, hey, mom, I'm so thirsty. Does your mom give you water? Yes, right? If you go and say, I'm so hungry, I want Oreos. They'll probably say no, because supper time is around the corner, because they will give you what you need, which is delicious food that will nourish you. And so in the same way, Jesus locates this for us in a parent and son and child relationship. For which one of you, if his son asked him for bread, will give him a stone? No, of course not. We would not do that. Or ask for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. Again, we see almost the joking nature of our King Jesus. It's so absurd that I can imagine the first century listeners really leaning in to listen and think that is mad. Who would do that? And so Jesus goes on to his teaching of this. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? What a wonderful teaching and promise by Jesus. If you then who are evil, that's you and me, born into this world of sin, we can't stay away from what is evil, but by the power of Jesus. And even when we do, we fall short of the glory of God and his mercies are anew each day. So us who are evil, who are in this constant wrestle of what it means to be good, we're able to give good gifts to our children, to those who ask. So how much more will our Father in heaven, who is perfect, give good things to those who ask? It's this beautiful argument that Jesus uses. It's called a fortori argument. All right, kids, write that down. We're going to test you at a holiday club. A fortori argument. I might be even saying it wrong. It's F-O-R-T. I think it's Latin. I-O-R-I. Fortori. Any Latin people, tell me how to say that. Kids, write it down. It's this beautiful argument that basically says, if the lesser is true, if us as sinners are able to do good things, how much more will the greater be true? The fact that God who is perfect will give us good gifts. And so if the lesser is true, man, how much more true is the greater? A beautiful argument about Jesus that cannot be denied. God is perfect. And if we as broken people can give good gifts, how much better will our good father who is perfect give good gifts to those who ask? 
Now, we have to be cautious here because sometimes this verse uh, or this passage of Scripture has been used for like the name it and claim it statement. And so, you know, if you just name it and claim it, God will give it to you because it says, uh, ask and you will receive. Now, we have to be so careful because I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. We were taught earlier by Pastor Zwei on the disciples' prayer, formerly known as the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. And in here, we're being told that like almost our model of prayer, or rather the continuous nature of our prayer, to continuously ask, to continually seek, and to continually knock. See, I dusted off some of the Greek that I learned when I was at college. I'm not like Pastor Richard and uh, Pastor Justin with Greek floating around in my brain the whole time. And so I went and looked at the Greek because I thought it was quite fascinating the way Jesus built his arguments. Because to ask, seek, and knock, it seems like there's a growing urgency here. Um, and so to, to ask really is just to humbly kind of stay put and ask. But to, to seek, it requires movement and you've got to get up and go toward. And then to knock requires action uh, and almost a persistence, right? You don't just, to knock, there's a, there's a, it's a persistent thing. And so what Jesus is calling us to here through the wonderful usage of the Greek verb, it's called a present imperative active. It means it's an ongoing thing. We are to continually ask. We are continually to seek and to continually knock after our Lord. And as we do those things, our hearts will align with the heart of God. And we may start off asking for Ferraris, but in the end, we will be asking for what we truly need, His grace, his mercy, and food, and warmth, and good things. And we are promised in verse 11 that our Father who is heaven will give good things to those who ask him. So church, I want to encourage you to continually be this way, to continually have a poor spirit, to know your need of God and to continually ask, seek and knock. I have a cool story. Uh, actually, on last night, we were with the youth. They were busy getting everything ready and had a great chat with one of the youth. And they asked me, Brett, is marriage hard? Um, Marilyn wasn't around, so I spoke the truth. And I said, yes, it is hard. But I also was able to say to her with a big smile on my face, it is also the greatest thing about my life. Being outside of Jesus, just disclaimer, disclaimer, outside of Jesus, Marilyn is just the greatest gift in my life. And I remember praying for a wife. I didn't know Marilyn at that time. We hadn't met. And I was praying, Lord, please, I just, I love a wife that will love me well, love me for the mess I am be able to extend God's grace to me as you do, to be a picture of who you are. And I asked God, and I really sook the Lord, I seeked after him, I think that's the word, for, I don't know what the word is. Sook, is it sook? Sought. My mother-in-law over there is an English teacher who just submitted a PhD, so... I'm so sorry, mom in law <laughs> My English needs some sorting. I don't know. I really sought after God for a wife like Marilyn. And God was good to me. And he gave me the opportunity to knock on the door of Marilyn's heart. And that door was opened. And so I'm just absolutely, I stand here in awe knowing that God does love to give good gifts. And I don't know what the gift is in your life, but I know if you stop and pause and look at your life, you will see good things in it. Life is not easy. And many of us have different varying of good and bad lives. However, the joy of a Christian is to be able to look inside and even in the midst of difficulty, know that God is good and that he gives good gifts gifts. And so church, I encourage you to do just that. And so I want to land the sermon today in the golden rule, verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. This wonderful verse found in many other places um, outside of really just reading it here. I mean, I know this verse before I even became a Christian. I must have learned it in Sunday school or heard it taught. Um, but it's almost like a general principle that people like to live their lives by. 
Um, in fact, I found out that the UN has done research throughout the different religions and found some form of this rule in all religions. But this is where we see the wonderful beauty of Jesus, who was both the most perfect teacher this world has ever seen and also the son of God and had this divine ability to give us a teaching which was centuries ahead of its time. You see, when Jesus gives the golden rule, uh, at the time there was something known as the wooden rule, which is really where we get our tit for tat from. It's do to others as they do to you. So you compliment me, I compliment you. Um, You do something mean to me, I'll do something mean to you. And I was listening to a sermon by John Mark Homer who helped me uh, unpack what this wooden rule meant. And he also taught on the silver rule and what uh, he, he read, up and, uh, read up on. And I went and fact-checked him, by the way. But uh, what he said is in Confucius can, is accredited with coming up with a silver rule, which is the negative of the golden rule. So don't do to anyone what you don't want done to yourself. And again, so this is a good rule. If you lived your life by just this rule, it would probably the world would be a better place than it is right now, to be honest. You know, you don't want to hurt someone or you don't want to be hurt so don't hurt someone. You don't want to throw a stone at someone, so don't let someone throw a stone at you. You know what I'm trying to say. I'm getting them mixed up. You know what I'm saying. It's, it's Confucius' rule. It's not that important. The golden rule, that's what's important. But what Jesus does, Jesus does is he moves it from an inaction space of saying, I don't want something, so I'm not going to do it. He moves it into an action space, right? So he says, we are forced to move towards. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, and here it is, do also. Do also to them. And this is the golden rule because it ties together everything we've been learning through the Sermon on the Mount. You know, if we don't want, we don't want to be judged. And so we mustn't judge others, but don't just do that. Move towards people. Right, go and love them in their brokenness. Don't just stand back and say, well, I'm not gonna judge them because I don't wanna be judged, but step towards them and help them in their brokenness. Do to them as you want done to yourself. So if you're caught in sin, how would you like to be made right? That someone comes to you with a beautiful gospel message that says, brother, that is not of God, but also that's why God died for you because his mercy and grace is new each day. You can rise up out of the sin. Be restored, brother. That is what the golden rule is. It's calling us to go towards people. And if you were to read up, I mean, I I didn't plan this, so let's just go up and see, right? Uh, uh, Let's go all the way up into um, giving to the needy. There you go. We learned that in the beginning of chapter six, right? If you were in need, you would want someone to come towards you and give to you. You would want that. And so what Jesus is calling us to is to outwork what we've been taught throughout the Sermon on the Mount is to step towards people who have need, to give to them. Because if you were in that position, you would want the the same thing to be done to you. And so Jesus is calling us, his disciples, to wonderful action. He's calling us to step towards people in love and to share with them the great gospel message that God is good and that God loves to give good gifts. In fact, the greatest gift he ever gave us was his son, Jesus Christ, hung on a cross for the forgiveness of sins. And because of that good gift that we get to receive, there are other wonderful gifts that we can thank God for in our lives. And we can step towards people who are in need. And so church, what I would love to leave you with and those legends who are coming to Holiday Club, I want to ask you to be a people of action who step toward the need. So Holiday Club kids, when you see your leader looking for stuff to give out and hand out paper, think, if I was in that position, I'd want someone to help me. So go towards them and say, hey, can I help hand out the pens for you? All right? Uh, For the rest of us, I want to call us as Christians to be known what we stand for not what we stand against, that we stand for people, that we go towards people to love them, protect them, and call them to the holy standard of God through the grace, love, and mercy of Jesus Christ. That is the golden rule. Won't you pray with me? Father, we thank you so very much that your word is plainly stated there for us to follow and work out. But we cannot do it without your Holy Spirit. 
And so move within us, please, Holy Spirit. Make these words not just be words on a page, but words that sink deep into our hearts. Help us live out the golden rule. Help us move towards those and help us give good gifts because we have received the wonderful good gift of your grace. We love you, Lord, and we pray all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.